What the hell, Kim? Here I am in Illinois, and they've got legal cannabis. If I buy weed on this side of the bridge, I'm buying it from a crook. If I buy weed on that side of the bridge, I'm buying it from a reputable business person. Our laws in Iowa put people into rape cages because they smoke marijuana. How about Barack Obama, Kamala Harris, George Bush, his friend Bill Clinton, Joe Rogan used some too, I heard. It's not a gateway to anything other than illegality. So when's the drug war going to end in Iowa, Kim? Easy answer, the day I'm governor. I'm Rick Stewart, and I approve this message. Stutterbox Productions is a backbone for many of the events that you see in the Midwest, from EDM festivals to late-night hip-hop shows. This company has been working closely with this podcast since the beginning, and we always have plenty of things planned for the future. So if you're looking to plan your next gig or event, head over to their Facebook page to learn more. Let me paint a picture for you. You're an artist, a visionary, or maybe you're just someone who has an idea, but you don't know where to start. Well, here are the McAllister Hours. I have the solution. Gorilla Graphics Design Agency can provide you with top-tier effects and production value. Their team has everything you can ask for, including professional equipment and a stellar end product from top to bottom. Head over to GorillaGraphics.com for all of your design needs today. That's G-U-E-R-R-I-L-L-A-G-R-F-X.com. This is the McAllister Arts Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Colt McAllister. Uh, we're joined today by returning uh, guest, Libertarian candidate for governor, Rick Stewart. How are you doing today, man? Pretty good. Beautiful day out there. Uh, looks like we're going to have even better weather for the weekend, and that's good for me because I need a whole day to put my garden away. You know what? The last time you we were here, it was good weather, too, so it must just be a, a good sign every time that you're coming to town, you're going to bring good weather. Let's start getting together more often. <laughs> Let's do it. Maybe we can hold off all the snow for the winter if we just get together. Every winter. You know, I don't know why we're living in Iowa. It has four seasons. <laughs> Can't we go somewhere where there's only three? Or five would be better. But, you know, I live in Cedar Rapids, and the nickname of our city is the season of five seasons. The city mm. of five seasons. So where is what is that damn fifth season anyway? Some people say it's taxes. It's like, I don't want that one. That's funny. That's some funny. Pe- some people say it's smell, but actually that uh, probably isn't ours anymore. Uh, back when I first moved to Cedar Rapids, which was 44 years ago, uh, we definitely had a smell season. Uh, unfortunately, it was all year long because we had a meatpacking plant almost downtown. Uh, and I don't know how they smell these days because I haven't visited one, but I can tell you this. Uh, that meatpacking plant was not a pretty neighbor. It, definitely a small yeah. pollution problem come out of there. I, I, let me tell you just a little story. Okay? Go for it, go for it. I used to live literally only a block from it when I first got to town in an apartment. And I woke up one night. Uh, this is an apartment with the windows closed and the air conditioner running. And I thought I was, I was sleeping on the couch. You know, what that means, right? So I probably, probably was a little bit too uh, drinking too much the night before. <laughs> and uh, uh, I woke up and I smelled something and I said to myself, Oh no, I must have vomited before I fell asleep on the couch. <laughs> so I got up. This is you know, like in the middle of the night. I got up, I looked all around for it, and then finally I figured out, oh no, that's that's the way it always smells when the uh, meat packing plant is going at full steam. Oh uh, yeah, man. Uh, I used to, you know, I grew up in a small town. I was around those kind of smells all the time. You know, driving through the country, and you know, you see the manure, you know, past the meat packing plant, and yeah, it is a uh, is a distinct smell for well, sure. My dad was a vocag teacher, and every time we drove by a hog farm, they're the ones that smell the worst. Mm-hmm. The the cattle confinement can be bad. H- horses, you know, they smell good, but the uh, the hogs, they, no matter what you do, they don't smell good. And he always he would always go. Oh, smell that money. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. So, Rick, let me ask you, uh, you know, you, uh, by the time this comes out, we'll, we're going to put this out the day before Election Day just to kind of, you know, get the word out about libertarianism and what you're doing and, you know, try to promote that a little bit. Um, but let me ask you, you know, you, you've been ramping up, I'm sure, in the last couple months getting ready for this thing. Um, you know, libertarianism, I feel like, is at an all-time high right now. You know, it's people are talking about it's out there. How do you feel going into this uh, governor race upcoming? 
Well, I feel as good as I can. Uh, the, the polls sometimes make you feel good, and sometimes they make you feel bad. Sure. But there aren't very many polls in Iowa for this governor's race. Mm -hmm. So uh, the last one that came out just uh, last week, I think, or maybe even earlier this week, uh, I came in at 4%. So that's one point down from where I was in July, the same poll, Iowa poll. Uh, and, you know, you'd much rather come in at 6 but these polls, you, you cannot put too much weight on them. Number one, no, all they never. ask is about 900 uh, people. And then if you, it, they ask 900 people, but it, they have another number, which is the number of people that are actually going to vote. And that's mm, smaller. It's yeah. under 700. So, uh, you know, you, you got you to gotta take it the way it comes and not care about it. I've been real active. I've been uh, participating already in, 50 iowa parades all around the state oh wow yeah i pull my truck in my trailer and my, i got one more coming up in mcgregor i think and that's you know that'll be the end of the parade season i've i've touched the hands of a lot of iowans and a lot of iowans have seen my trailer and uh i think that that works now the problem of course is that for a libertarian there's two things that you need number one you need people to know that libertarians actually have a party <laughs> now we have parties all the time but i'm not talking about that kind of party i'm talking about we're an organized political party mm. and most iowans don't know that the way to find out is to do a poll and ask people a simple question such as can you name the political parties in iowa don't give many hints <laughs> <laughs> uh and if uh you know if you got 50 percent that said uh, that big dumb elephant party and that <laughs> dumb donkey party and then uh, what's the name of it it's the libertarian party if you could get 50 percent of them to include your name basically your job is done you you don't really have to worry about it after that because uh, understanding that there is a libertarian party is job number one job number two if you're a candidate is to make sure that people know your name and i've done my best to make sure everybody in iowa knows the name rick stewart but i can guarantee you that the vast majority of them don't and it's a pretty simple reason number one i'm not famous so <laughs> they don't know my name because i'm a comedian or a great baseball player or anything like that uh, and then number two it just comes down to money marketing your name is like marketing kleenex you, you got to advertise it you got to get it out there you got to hammer it into people's heads if if you're just running a marketing campaign for a consumer prod consumer product that's the number one job name identification they, they need to know oh there's something called kleenex out there i wonder i wonder what it is so you know i don't have the kind of money that i can advertise to the entire state my opponents they have a lot more money mm -hmm. i think deedry has I haven't checked the latest numbers because really they're just coming out. I think the due date is tomorrow, but sometimes they file a little bit early. I haven't looked at it. She's just had a horrible time. That's Deidre DeGier, the Democratic mm -hmm. challenger to me. Yeah, that's not surprising. Uh, but she's had a million dollars, and I just have barely tipped over 50. So she has 20 times as much money. She wow. still has a name recognition problem in Iowa. Not enough people actually know who she is. Kim Reynolds, on the other hand, who is our current governor, serving her first complete term, but she started before because Terry Branstad handed the reins over to her after he became the ambassador to China. Uh, her name recognition is just right towards the top. The only mm -hmm. people that don't recognize her name uh, are people who maybe they moved in to Iowa yesterday. <laughs> uh, but she also has, last I looked, she had five million bucks. So wow. if it, just in case somebody doesn't know her name, well, now they do because she advertises. And, we, you know, it, it takes money. People would like to think that voters vote on ideas and, and policy statements and positions on certain topics. But if they don't know your name, it's really hard to get a voter to vote for you. So those are the two big challenges. I've been working really hard on the budget that I have to make myself known and the final poll of the season, of course, is on November 8th, the election day. And that's when we'll find out how many Iowans know my name, know what, that there's a Libertarian Party, and decided that they should vote for me. Hell yeah, hell yeah. Well, I'm really excited for that, man. And, um, you know, I love what you're doing. I love your campaign, everything you stand for. Um, let me ask you this. Um, I'm going to do uh, Libertarian's favorite thing to do, which is play devil's advocate. Um, well, you're not going to be a contrarian on me now, are you? <laughs> It's like, please, please. I came here for a restful afternoon. I just had a real stressful meeting at the board of the of Iowa PBS, telling them basically that they're 
wrong and a bunch of hoo-ha because they excluded me from their debates because I'm not a Republican and I'm not a Democrat. Yeah, that's... Now, you got to relax me, man. you got to take care of me. (laughs) I came here to have have a fun conversation. (laughs) Let me just ask you one question. Um, You know, a a lot of the criticism about the Libertarian Party and, you know, third parties in general is that it takes away the vote um from you know democrat republican and obviously you know this is a pretty basic libertarian point um and i can probably guess your answer but what's your response to um people that may say that well how can i take away something from somebody that doesn't own it hmm. do they think they own the vote <laughs> like, well they bought it and, and they want to keep it and if i take it from them i'm stealing the vote so i'm going to steal the election Every every person can vote whatever the way whatever way they want when they're in the ballot box, and there's no vote that's going to steal anything from anybody else. It's what your, it's your expression of your beliefs of who would be the best governor in Iowa. I agree. So how, it's the idea that somehow or another I can take votes away from somebody, it, it, it's just phenomenal to me. I don't go into the into the voting booth uh, wondering like, um, whose vote can I steal. <laughs> Nobody does. They vote for the candidate that has impressed them the most. Unfortunately, they've never heard of Libertarian Party and they've never heard of me. At least most of them haven't. So, yeah, they're not going to vote for me for that simple reason. But the idea that I can ruin somebody else's party. (laughs) Yeah. Another way to look at it is this way. Um, if, If I took a vote away from you. You must not have been doing a very good job of of winning it and keeping it in the first place. Exactly. I mean, uh, guard your treasure. Put a put up a fence around it. Come up with good policies. Tell people why they shouldn't why they should vote for you. Don't tell them why they shouldn't vote for me. I did get a, a question just this this week from somebody who asked the same question, but his math was pretty amazing. He said, uh, <laughs> he, he had said, a whole formula and everything. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he said, well, if you, if you take, if you take half the votes away from Kim Reynolds, then Deidre Dejir will win. And he did the math, right? Because even if I had half of Kim Reynolds votes, that would be about 25 or 26%. Plus my own, that would be 30. I still wouldn't have as many as Deidre has because she's got 26 and then she'd win. Kim would come in second. I'd still come in last. But it'd be my fault that we have Deidre Dejir. <laughs> you know, I bear personal responsibility for the fact that Deidre Dejir won. Gracious uh. sakes alive. But it's, it's difficult to explain to somebody. Politics is a business, and it's a business that runs on math. And it's completely possible that I could take away half of Kim Reynolds' votes. But the probability is extremely low. That's just not going to happen. Unless you give me probably $50 million to spend in the next three weeks. (laughs) By the way, if you you just want to subtract one zero from that, it's okay with me. But don't take off two. uh, So, you know, (laughs) how do I explain to somebody who thinks that's the way politics works that it's an impossibility, his scenario? In fact, what I told him was I said, I have a bigger chance of winning than Didier Dejir does. Because who knows? Uh, something really strange could happen, and a lot of Republicans and Democrats would vote for me. But there's no Republican in the state that's ever going to vote for Deidre because Deidre's such a far left person that you know they would uh, I, they'd probably cross her name off the ballot before they'd ever uh, think of voting for her. Whereas me, I'm an unknown, and basically, you know, more or less, libertarian policies are about half. Republican and half, sure. half Democrat, but all of our own. Yeah, because it's not like Republicans have any no good ideas or only bad ideas. Uh, we like a lot of the stuff that the Republicans and Democrats stand for, mm-hmm. but we have principles. Sure, and you don't know what the principles of those parties are. The Republican Party, uh, what was it two years ago? They didn't even have a platform. They, they they didn't even pretend like they were standing for anything. They they were standing for personalities. Uh, the Democrats did have one, and I think it was so long that no one has ever read it uh, because they just put everything on you. Know, it's like the compost. <laughs> just, <laughs> hey, here's this an idea. Here's a, but we're going to throw it all away anyway because all we're going to do is campaign on hating your neighbor. <laughs> if your neighbor comes from a different political party, you got to hate him. Yeah, Wouldn't right. you hate to have both a Republican and a, and a a Republican on one side, a Democrat on the other, and you're a libertarian. I have to hate both these people. <laughs> I, I go to barbecue with them. 
<laughs> you know, I, I drive the kids to school when the mom's busy. It's like, why do I have to hate them? But that's yeah. what that's what uh, the business of politics has evolved into. The only thing that counts are, are the people in the middle, mm. and the people in the middle. The only way you, you, the best way to get them to vote for you, is to make them afraid of the other party. Mm. So all the advertising is against somebody, and oh my, you don't have the slightest idea it would be worse than the hurricane in Florida if that guy won. It's like, no, it's really not going to be that bad. Not that much is going to change if you elect a Republican or a Democrat. Hell, they're the ones that built the damn system. They both love it. Only two parties. You win 50% of the time. I win 50% of the time. Both of us screw the economy. Hey, you know, everything's fine in political land. <laughs> Libertarians have principles. And I stand by every single one of the libertarian principles. If you've ever read the, the libertarian principles on the national LP website, I do that on a regular basis just to make mm. sure, because how could they possibly have gotten so many things right and so few things wrong? And every time I read them, I, I just go, oh, my God, it's, it's just as good as it was the very first time I read it. Uh, I wouldn't have time to read the Democratic uh, principles, and the Republicans don't have any. So. <laughs> <laughs> You're sort of stuck. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Um, let me ask you this: uh, your two ca- your two opposing candidates, Reynolds and who, who's the other one, Dietrich? Oh, gee, look, we don't even have name recognition, and we're right here in Des Moines, where she lives. <laughs> I think you just proved my point. Exactly. Her name is Deidre Dejir. Deidre Deidre Dejir. Yeah, Deidre Deidre Dejir. Um, let me ask you this: if you were to like list off the things about your opponents that um you know are bad reasons to vote for them and you know maybe you know make the case why you know they should vote for you uh just explain that like what about those two candidates um would be a bad situation if iowans you know decide to you know either continue kim reynolds's governorship or um you know bring in this other candidate are you asking me to do some negative campaigning <laughs> Right here in your, I, I'm a guest, aren't I a guest in your house? You're asking me to misbehave? What are we going to do next? Go smoke a doobie in the back room, which I don't do, but you're going to force me? I actually have one rolled up right here. No, yeah. <laughs> well, okay, I'm going to answer the question the way I would answer it any time. There are things that I admire Kim Reynolds for, and I'm going to talk about them first. She sure. cut the, the income tax to a flat rate, which is the best way. If you're going to have an income tax, it should be a flat rate. Now, you shouldn't have an income tax because it's the worst possible tax. It's inefficient, it's ineffective, and it irritates me. Those are the three I's. But not that. Not just that. It's also it's what creates a slush fund for politicians. Because then they get to do what Voltaire, the famous French philosopher, said in 1764, which, if you will remember, was before we even existed as a country. He said, the art of government is to take as much money as possible away from one group of people and give it to a different group of people. This was before democracy was invented, other than in in Greece, which was 2,500 years ago. So what income tax allows the politicians to do is to do exactly that. They reward their friends and they punish their enemies. Uh, And for that reason, the income tax in America, if you actually looked at the income tax code, I think it's 41,000 pages. (laughs) When's the last time you read a book that had 41,000 pages in it? I've read some long books, James Joyce's Ulysses, uh, the, um, you know, what's the Russian guy? It's not the, uh, well, but anyway, they're, they're, you know, um, they're, they're, I've read some long books, but none of them were a thousand pages long. Yeah, I think you, you could probably stack the Bible 20 times and it still wouldn't be that much. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that they've beaten the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, I mean, it is good. Income tax is a a horrible tax, and we should eliminate it. And by taking the top rate down and having a flat tax of 3.9%, that's a a big step in the right direction. Um, Good. She also tried to get uh, school vouchers passed, and, of course, the Democrats distorted that into complete meaningless by saying they were stealing money from the public schools, which, of course, no, they're giving money to private schools. They were, I think, 50,000 scholarships for kids that whose parents can't afford to send them to a private school so it's not stealing anything i mean these kids leave the public school system that means the public school system doesn't have to teach them so they don't need the money give it to the people who are teaching them Mm. um but on the other hand kim reynolds has done some things which uh, basically are just socialism Mm. and i mean now now the republicans are are socialists it's a strange world we live in no i agree so she uh um 
She gave $100 million out of that slush fund to build a new base, private baseball stadium. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, so that's socialism, right? Jesus. When the government builds a, a sporting facility, it's socialism. Um, she, uh, she loves eminent domain. She's been completely corrupted on that, but she still loves it. Eminent domain is when the government comes and takes your property. It is legal under the Iowa Constitution, but what they're going to do this year, and just you heard it from me. You hopefully you didn't hear it from me first. Kim Reynolds is going to allow the Iowa Utilities Board to say that these private pipelines, these CO2 pipelines in Iowa, are going to be able to steal the land from Iowa landowners so that they can put a pipeline through it. Uh, that's socialism. If the government yep. takes your land and then gives it to a private entity, that's socialism. And you know, that's okay. I'm not calling Kim Reynolds a socialist. I'm just saying if you support socialist policies, then I don't know what you are because you're sure as hell not an old style Republican. You're not, you're definitely not a libertarian. Uh, you know that's just socialism. Now on the other hand, I'm going to move over to to Deidre Dejere. She's a super nice lady. She's got a super big heart. I've watched her get much better at her stump speech. Uh, which is the only speech she has. She can't ad lib anything because if she has to talk about a specific policy, she's completely lost, which I'm not trying to say that's bad. I, there's a lot of policies I couldn't talk about, but the only thing Deidre DeGere wants to do is, quote, invest. Mm. Healthcare, we have to invest. Public schools, we have to invest. Mental health, we have to invest. So these are three questions that we have, but Deidre's only answer is invest. And let me tell you what she means by invest. What she means is spend more tax money. Mm -hmm. And that tax money is going to, of course, it doesn't come from anywhere else. It's going to come from Iowa citizens. Yep. So what Deidre Desir wants to do is spend the money that today is in the pocket of the taxpayer, their own pocket. She wants to take it out of their pocket and so she can spend it. Those are just... That's a bad way to think about government. That's not government's role to, oh, wait a second. It's not the government's role, but it is the art of government, <laughs> is to take as much money away from one group of people and give it to the people that are on your side. And I'd say, from the grand scheme of things, those are the big things that make both of those candidates. I'm not going to say that they make some bad candidates. All I'm going to say is, I, that's why I'm a better candidate, because I'm not going to do any of that. I'm not going to. There's no not going to be any socialist policy that gets signed by me when I'm the governor, and I'm not going to try and take money away from taxpayers and spend it on my own little personal projects. It goes against my principles, so I won't do it. Hmm. Well, hey, uh, you know that's one thing I really love about you, Rick, is that. Um, oh come is, on! You, you, what, just the, one. Just the one. way you say that sounds like there's only one. All right. I want the top ten. Just like David Letterman, I went eight, nine, eight. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> no, but one of the things I really do love about you is, uh, you know, uh, you, you like you is very clear that your principles are what defines you as a candidate and as a person in general. Like I think, you know, again, I know we were just saying, you know, don't negatively criticize your candidates, but you know, I think you could see in like you know Kim Rails and a candidate that like there is something that's more of like a teleprompter base. They have talking points. They have you know, they're they're trying to sell something. And you're not necessarily trying to sell something. You were just simply saying, these are my principles, and this is why if you, you know, vote for me, this is the best option. Well, I'd love to sell myself. <laughs> if you give me $50 million, <laughs> um, it's, that's, that's all I really want. I'm an open book. I've always been an open book. Uh, when I was the CEO of Frontier, which today is a $200 million company with 600 employees, wow. I had an open door policy, and anybody could just walk through. My door literally was open. Uh, I was sort of at the end of the hallway, although you could make a loop. And uh, if you wanted to talk to me, the most I would do is I'd say, let me get off this phone call first. But yeah, you can come in and talk to me. And I think that's the way that government really should be, too. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, since the last time we talked, I read the autobiography of Harold Hughes, who was an Iowa governor back in the 60s. And he was a Democrat. There are not a lot of, of Democratic uh, governors in Iowa history. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Harold Hughes, he, he did have an open door policy. Every Wednesday, anybody in Iowa could come to the governor's, no, to the state house where his office is and Wait in line. You got to ask the governor for help. I don't know what was wrong with that. I don't know why everybody else thought that wasn't necessary, but I'm an open book and I'm going to have an open office. In fact, in the spirit of transparency, 
which I think is extremely important. We should know what our government officials are doing. They shouldn't close the door and start smoking inside there and then make deals and come out and, and pretend like they haven't been uh, influenced by the other person in the room. I'm going to wear I'm going to wear a body cam all the time. Um, if I'm at home and I do not have guests, I'm going to turn it off because I think that privacy is important. But when I have when I'm talking to somebody that isn't my family, the public has the right to know who the hell I'm talking to and what I'm talking about, and they should be able to just flip on the the live stream and find out in case they're interested. So um, I don't know. To me, that just seems obvious. We ask our cops to wear body cams. Why? Because we hate them, or because we love them, or is it just because we'd like to make sure that if something happens, we get an honest camera? action of the of what it was that happened they've been i think extremely effective except when the officers t- <laughs> turn, them <off. laughs> turn them off just so before they do something accident. nasty yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh i don't know why my body cam well, the button was working. next to my holster oh. yeah bam 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 <laughs> oh it's on again oh why is this guy lying in the middle of the street <laughs> okay i think i i need to call a emt uh, but i'll be real slow about it because i don't really like this guy <laughs> Yeah, well, that's the thing I can't stand about Kim Reynolds is she is uh, very on the diplomatic immunity for police. I think that, or maybe I'm not saying that. Yeah, right. it's not diplomatic immunity; it's qualified immunity. Qualified immunity. There you yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, qualified immunity basically gives not just the police, but every government government employee a uh, get out of jail free card. Yep. Which I don't want to put anybody in jail, but if you violate the constitution, if you're a public official and you violate the constitution, and you know. It's not because you got trained well. It's just because you know that you're violating the Constitution. Why should you get qualified immunity? Qualified immunity means that if <laughs> these kinds of things really happen, and anybody that's interested should look, look it up, but qualified immunity means that I can stop you, take all your money, claiming that you thought I thought you were a terrorist, <laughs> mm, or drugs, or whatever. I, I want to stay away from the drugs, but it does, yeah, it's whatever. Uh, it's definitely with drugs. Although you have to ask yourself, why do the cops want all your drugs? <laughs> what what are the, is there something going on here that doesn't sound right? Is, is, like, can't they buy their own damn drugs? Why do they have to steal mine? <laughs> Jeez, I don't steal anybody else's drugs. Wow, How come can, cops get to? They can make their own drugs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But qualified immunity means that after the cop steals your drugs, um, you know, you go, hey, that's unconstitutional. And they go, yeah, that's too bad. But um, <laughs> cops get to do that because they have qualified immunity. It's, mo- it's just most bizarre. There's no law about co- uh, qualified immunity at all. It's not in the books. What it is is the Supreme Court. Oh, my gosh. I really value the Supreme Court. I honor them, but man, there are some mistakes they've made which are very long-lasting and far-reaching. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the ones they need to get back in there. And I think they will. Some of the new justices, I think they're a little suspicious of this legal doctrine that determines whether or not a cop can steal your stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, so hopefully they will. But the original was a mistake. We, well, Of course they've made mistakes. All the way through history, we've seen that the Supreme Court has made mistakes. And um, they sometimes they, they correct them. But there's still a lot left that the Supreme Court needs to face up to the fact that they were wrong 50 years ago. And now they got to fix their mistake. They did that with Roe v. Wade. I do think that Roe v. Wade, their original decision was incorrect. Hmm. I don't think there's a constitutional right that I can read in the Constitution to get an abortion. But I also don't think there's a constitutional statement that says you do not have bodily autonomy. I, I, I can't find that in the American Constitution. So... Uh, to me, there's a difference between I have, cons- I have bodily autonomy, versus I have a right to an abortion. I think, from my perspective, I have a right to be left alone by the government, mm-hmm. and I'm anti-abortion. I believe life starts at conception, but that does not translate into the government has a right to tell me that I can't have one. Mm-hmm. You, un- you understand? It's like okay. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to, if my neighbor gets an abortion, I'm not going to go next door and beat her up because, because that's the wrong thing to do. Yeah. No, I mean, 
she has bodily autonomy and that protects her from me and it protects her from the government there's no i don't think that the word abortion should be in any law ever and here's my simple simple explanation of that abortion has bedeviled the human family for thousands of years every religion has wrestled with that question and they've arrived at a conclusion that satisfies the people who follow or who are members of that religion. But every one of those solutions is different. Now, we've had the greatest philosophers and the greatest spiritual thinkers in the history of humankind decide different answers to that question. What the hell chance do we have of a politician coming up with a better idea? None. So that what that tells me is Let's not ask the politicians to perform an impossible task. In fact, let's tell the politicians abortion is not your concern. I, I agree. D- don't you think that striking down Roe v. Wade was a step further in that direction, though? Don't you think that giving states that right is um, more in line with, like, you know, that libertarian value of, you know, autonomy and freedom from, you know, government decisions? Well, yeah, I think it's the, a step in the right direction because I think the original decision was incorrect. <laughs> what can I say? We used to have a country where everybody was under one rule, Roe v. Wade, and now we have a country where that rule simply does not exist. So they didn't really give the states a right. They gave the states an opportunity. And those are different. Hmm. What they said was the federal government doesn't have the right. In other words, the Supreme Court doesn't have the right because that's where it came from. I don't think you're going to find the Roe v. Wade uh, decision in the United States Constitution. It turns out the justices agree with me. Hmm. So they didn't say you have to do something. They didn't say you can't do something. They just said the federal government doesn't have a right to say that. So that's it. Now, of course, if you, you know, if you drop something on the floor and walk away, then you've given everybody around the right to pick it up and go their way, which because I don't believe in one size fits all. Yeah, I'd rather have 50 sizes fits all. Nobody. <laughs> because there's no state that has so few people in it that they aren't going to make, no matter what they do, they're not going to make some people happy. The best thing to do is to just get it out of the hands of government. And I don't think there was any founder of either the federal government or any of the 50 states that would have said, oh, yeah, abortion, that's what the government should handle. We've progressed to a certain spot not because it's in our constitutions or because it's in the original idea of freedom, but because over the course of time, there's been a lot of bad decisions made by a lot of politicians, and here we are. We're stuck with a lot of old bad decisions, and we're on the verge of making a bunch of new bad decisions. Get the hell out of the question. I agree. I agree. And thank you after you do. (laughs) I I have a personal experience with abortion. I never got one, but... um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I think you should bring on the only man in the world who's ever had an abortion. And I want to be here and talk to him. Because, you know, how did it feel? How old was the fetus? How'd you get pregnant in the first place? But um, it's a question which has bedeviled us for thousands of years. Uh, and it bedeviled me when my girlfriend of the, at the time told me that she was pregnant. Now, she had already had an abortion in her life before I came along. I was not ready to be a dad. I was had a lot of other plans, and they did not involve small children. And I'd had these plans for quite a while. For you know, three or four or five years, I'd had the same plan. I was saving up money to take a five-year trip to South America and do a lot of cocaine. Hmm. This was before I'd ever done any cocaine, and I knew nothing about cocaine. (laughs) But, you know, that's what I was planning on doing because that's what I had done two years uh, in Europe and the Middle East and Asia. I'd done a lot of marijuana and hashish. And it was great for me because it was cheap as hell. In Afghanistan, it was two cents a gram for black Afghani hash. (laughs) And my little brain went, you know, I'm poor today because when I first left the United States, I, I left with $500. I came back two years later. Uh, I could still afford one cent, two cents a gram black Afghani hand-pressed hash. But um, I was going to come back. I was going to save my money. I was going to get $5,000 together, and I was going to go to South America and do cocaine in Colombia because I read a book that said that cocaine wasn't addictive and it was really good drug, and, you know, 
So I'm like, well, the smart thing to do if you would like to try that stuff is you should go to the place where they make it. And that'd be Columbia. So anyway, this, why did I go this way on this story? <laughs> so anyway, uh, my, my girlfriend announced that she was pregnant, and I left the house that day in shock. And I thought about it all day long. It, it bugged me. I, I was in uh, college at the time, and it really just dragged on me because, boy, oh, boy, what a surprise. Um. I don't know why I was surprised because if you think about how you know the birds and the bees do that little thing and then they get more birds and more bees, um, yeah, we'd done that little thing a couple of times. Anyway, I came home and I sat down. It still it took a couple of hours, and and I said, well, I think we should be parents. I had the option of because she would have gotten abortion if I said get an abortion, but um, I didn't. I said let's have let's have kids. Or no, let's just have one. <laughs> and today that kid is 44 years old and she's my best friend in the world. Now, I only say that because I only have one daughter, but she's wonderful. We are as tight as I think any father and, and child could ever be. Uh, total confidence in each other. Over the course of those 44 years, we've probably had no more than five fights and they weren't that bad. She's wow. absolutely wonderful, and I'm so glad that we didn't get an abortion. And I would hope that everybody would be able to make that same decision because you don't know what's in the womb, and it could be the miracle that you're waiting for. So I'm anti-abortion in terms of that story because I'm really glad we didn't get one but I'm not anti-abortion in any legal sense whatsoever, and I think that every woman is going to have to decide for themselves, and they should decide for themselves, and they have the right to decide for themselves with the assistance of whoever it is that they trust to make that decision. Their spiritual leader, their doctor, their partner, their family, their friends, whoever they feel is in a position to help them make that decision. And I pray that that decision will always be, let's create life. But if that's not the decision that's made, I can live with that too. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's a good sentiment. And, you know, going back to like, you know, we're talking about government and taxes, um, you know, that, you know, creates something that is going to, you know, make people maybe lean more towards, you know, ending that life abortion. Because, you know, I think a lot of the reason why people, you know, are so hesitant to have kids and, you know, go through that is because things are just expensive. And a lot of the reason why things are expensive is because of inflation, because of taxes, you know. So it's kind of, it's interesting. It's all kind of circles back, you know. Well, you know, if we didn't have any taxes and we got to keep that 40% of our dollar that the government uh, steals from us, uh, things would still be the same price, but we'd have, seven, what, 67% more money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. maybe I could afford that now. Exactly. Yeah, the government makes life miserable for everybody when they take <laughs> your money. Yeah even if they give a little bit of it back to you. You know, that, that stimulus check always cracks me up. Uh, the first one <laughs> the first one was 1200 bucks. Now, who wouldn't want to get a $1,200 check in the mail? I would. I want, I'm going to go home and look in the mail, see if I got a $1,200 check. So I sure as hell cashed mine. But that's not the end of the story. The end of the story is that the total amount of money that they spent just on the first stimulus bill was $6,200 for each of us. Wow. So they spent sixty two hundred dollars. I I got a twelve hundred dollar check, and you, I'm going to have to pay that back. Yeah, that yep. five thousand dollars. They don't have a big pot of gold under the Capitol dome, <laughs> where if they need to give us money, they go down and and, and let you make a little bit more gold here. We got to uh, give Rick twelve hundred bucks. <laughs> no, I'm going to pay sixty two hundred dollars in taxes for the privilege of cashing a twelve hundred dollar check. That's not the way to run an economy it's not the way to treat taxpayers well it's not the way to to follow the american constitution or the iowa constitution there's really no excuse for that kind of I, i'm only going to say bs hmm. um but you know so many americans were fooled by that well hell just today how much is that how much is that twelve hundred dollars worth now um let's see uh inflation is eight percent so it's worth about eleven hundred now hmm. Uh, but but the tax bill is going to go down too because they're going to they're going to pay the we're going to pay the tax bill with inflated dollars so we sort of come out ahead on that one 
People don't, they think everything's easy. Oh, inflation is bad. It's like, no, actually, inflation is good if I'm trying to pay the federal government off that uh, $5,000 that I have to. I want to I do it with inflated dollars. That is, actually, they, they understand that. That's not a mystery. Mm-hmm. Well, well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> every time the government spends a lot of extra money, that causes inflation, and they have to pay it back, but they get to pay it back with even more inflated money. Look, the official goal of the Federal Reserve is to inflate our money supply inflate our money away at a rate of two percent a year that's intentional we want to inflate the the money at two percent a year (laughs) what's the logic there what's how is it how am i better off if the fed inflates my money away at the rate of two percent a year yeah well i mean this is the problem right i mean and you know i'm sure you can relate to like as being a libertarian this can be the really frustrating thing because, you know, you could talk to someone either on the left or the right, and you could tell them all these things about inflation and taxes and all that. And at the end of the day, they'll probably still tell you, yeah, but it's for the greater good. Well, you know? most people don't understand uh, what percent means. Yeah. <laughs> I I don't understand it. To me, it was a fairly simple concept. It's just one hundredth of something and multiply it by another number. Uh, but when you say 2% inflation, a lot of people, they don't understand that um, – when you talk about percents, your limit is 100. Mm-hmm. Like if I took 2% of your money, you can't possibly have anything other than 98 cents back. Yeah. I so can't. if people can't even understand what a percent is, just do this quiz. I do this all the time. I like to annoy people. Uh, I just say, oh, you know, do you, can you tell me what 8% of 100 is? <laughs> okay, okay. I admit, about 20% of Americans can answer that question. <laughs> How about you? Uh, are you in the are you in the top eight yeah. percent of one hundred? That would What's, be what would eight percent of one hundred be? Um, that would be eight. <laughs> You're one of the chosen few. <laughs> you know, the other question I'd like to ask people is this: um, Can you tell me the name of your your governor, your senator, and your two senators, and your member of Congress? Um, Congress is Sidney Axney. Governor's Kim Reynolds. Um, I cannot think of the other two. Is that correct? Where's the camera? I want to look right into the camera. Where, where, where is it? Either either one right there. Either one of these? Yeah. Okay. So here I am talking to one of the most knowledgeable people in Des Moines <laughs> about politics. <laughs> and he got 50% on what I consider to be one of the easiest questions you could imagine. <laughs> who's the governor? Who are your two senators? And who's your, your member of Congress? <laughs> uh, mine is, is Governor Kim Reynolds, <laughs> Senator uh, Chuck Grassley, Senator Joni Ernst, uh, and um, Ashley Hinson. That's my congresswoman. Uh, but you okay. know what? You know what the percentage of success in that question is when you ask it? Probably 25%, right? Not Bingo. Even. It is. It's right out of quarter, <laughs> about a quarter of the people. I, of course, if you make it even easier, you say, well, who's the governor? I have to go out and get signatures. That's the way you get on the ballot. And so I needed 5,000 of them. So that meant I talked to 10,000 people because half of them didn't want to sign my piece of paper. Uh, and um, a lot of times, because I always say, you know, I'm running for governor. Would you help me get on the ballot? And a lot of people go, who is our governor? <laughs> These are adults. I'm not asking little kids. <laughs> They're alive, too. They're not in a nursing home. You don't even know the governor? I mean, really, the governor. I think most people do know the president half the time. Who would hope? <laughs> Is it still Trump? Didn't, didn't, no, I, I can't remember. Well, our president isn't alive, so that, I, I would give him a pass on that one, maybe, if they didn't. The Walking Dead, are you yeah. suggesting? <laughs> you know, I don't. We, there's a big argument about when you're dead. Is it when your brain is dead? <laughs> Is when your heart quits beating? At what point are we dead? They even have an expression, I think. It's called brain dead. <laughs> I've seen a lot of people that were walking around doing real normal things, though, and I, I, I think they could classify as brain dead based, based on what they're doing. Do you know, it's funny. I, you know, I like to insult people, but not real people. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, I'm, uh, I'm not the kind of guy. In fact, just this morning, uh, a friend of mine was talking, and he said, I hate blah, blah, blah. And that's just not a word that I use to actually mean hate. Because for me, hating a person especially, they're just like me. They're, they got two arms and two legs and they walk around, they breathe, they eat, 
they they urinate they they uh, what's that word for feces they uh, defecate they defecate, defecate. <laughs> um i do the same thing they've they've got a brain they've got a heart they've got a soul i i value every human being a lot and it's not hard for me to say i don't hate anybody and I, that includes the people that are on death row because they you know raped murdered and pillaged it, it, that's not a good situation but it doesn't make me hate the guy that did it. It just makes him, I want to protect us from him. Mm-hmm. So I do want him in a cage, but I want, him, I want him to be, and I'm saying him because that's probably what he is. Yeah, no, it's true. I, 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 I want that person to be treated with respect, with love, and I want us to try to get that guy. He, he suffers more than we do as long as he's locked up. And I want that person to recover the ability to be a functioning human being in our society. It doesn't mean I'm going to let him go on the first day he behaves. But that's the way I think about humans. I, I love every human on this planet more than I love any dog or cat or anything else. Even apes. I, you know, Humans, we're one species. And I don't understand how we can exist if we don't recognize that fact that we are all one. And... We need to respect every every person, even the ones that are, have done evil deeds. See, I differentiate, too. I don't say that the person who does evil deeds is an evil person. I say they did evil deeds. Just like with Kim Reynolds, I don't say she's a bad governor. I say some of the things that she passed were socialist policies. Mm. But I still love her just as much as I love everyone else. Hmm. That's interesting. Because I didn't want to get all sloppy here, you know. Pretty soon I'm going <laughs> to have to get a towel to wipe my tears out. But... <laughs> Love is is such a wonderful emotion for everybody. Nobody resists it, and hate is such a it's such a negative one. That nobody nobody feels better if they hate. It, it, it makes us feel badly. Mm-hmm. I don't want to feel badly. I want to feel I want to feel good every day from the minute I get up until the minute I go to bed. And uh, love is just a much better equation. Hmm, that's a that's a good way to look at it. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, one of the things that happened to you recently that um, I thought was very admirable is you protested in D.C. Um, for... Oh, yeah, they got me. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, uh, they were on the lookout for me, and they yeah. found me. Well, you were you were protesting uh, drug legalization, I believe, specifically for psilocybin. Um, because you, I think I remember reading that you had like a good friend or someone that um, su- succeeded from that treatment. And uh, you were, you know, you protested and you were in turn arrested. Um, what was, well, describe the experience. Well, um, you, were, you were half right, just like I am. I'm half right all the time, too. <laughs> uh, well, I try to be at least that. You yeah. Know. <laughs> uh, yeah. A friend uh, has been diagnosed with stage three cancer, stage four cancer, and therefore it basically has a death sentence. Uh, I think in her case, uh, it was, she was projected by the doctors to live for six more months. Is she still alive or? Uh, yeah, she still okay. is alive. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so there's a treatment f- called psychedelic assisted therapy. Mm-hmm. In this case, the psilocybin would be the psychedelic, so it would be psilocybin assisted therapy. Um, this is actually going to be legal in the United States probably in three years. It's already uh, going through the FDA process. Uh, uh, psilocybin is a hallucinogen, and doing it with a therapist uh, is a way to uh, minimize the death sentence, the emotions, the negativity that are associated mm-hmm. with you're going to be dead in six months, which, as you can imagine, is a traumatic sentence to receive from your doctor. So it's not that we don't know how to use this medicine. It's not that it's um, she just wants to go out and have a, a trip and, and like go to a party. She wants to go to a certified therapist and receive psilocybin-assisted therapy in order to help her confront the fact that They've already told her how when she's going to die, and she's a young, long, young person. She's maybe she's, she's probably oh, I don't know how old, thirty five, wow. maybe forty. Uh, and a law was actually passed in Congress that called the Right to Try that allows you to have and use therapy uh, medicines that are not yet approved for FDA by the by the entire FDA, but if they show promise of becoming approved, and psilocybin because it's already in the process, actually did exceptionally well in the stage three trials. In fact, the results of psilocybin-assisted therapy are nothing short of the best psychiatric drug we have ever had. 
I have a lot of experience. I don't have a lot. I have experience, real world experience. My son had a psychotic episode, and so I, you know, he had to go. Well, let's say we took him to the emergency room, and he was admitted to the psych ward wow. for three days, and then he felt better because they gave him some medication, and he checked himself out against my advice and his doctor's. Uh, but then two months later, he had another episode. They're pretty severe. Uh, wow. That's yeah, it's extremely severe. And this time, we checked him into the University of Iowa hospitals, and when he wanted to get out after three days. Uh, the family said no i'm pretty sure we should just stay in there a little bit longer and so he went through the process and he, he got to stay now that's a few years ago he's completely recovered he's back to the same exact job he had before he had the episode he takes oh, his good. medicine hasn't had any instance even remotely close so it's a little bit like an on off switch for him mm-hmm. so if he takes his medication it's off that's awesome that's awesome. And if he quits well we don't know what'll happen but we know what happened twice. <laughs> so anyway, the, the, the medications that they have for psychiatry, there's only about 60 of them in total that, mm. that are used. So it's not like there's a whole uh, panoply of a thousand different possibilities and that some of them are miraculous and some of them are not quite so good. None of them are that good. Yeah, but I if agree. you keep trying, you might find one that works. But with psilocybin assisted therapy it's 65 percent effective at eliminating ptsd wow which is depression yeah there is no other psychiatric medication that even comes close to that it's basically a miracle it's not a modern day miracle (laughs) the psilocybin mushrooms have been out there for a long time (laughs) they probably evolved with us because they figured out how to Get us not depressed. Yeah. So we have the, the right to try act allows people to, to use these drugs which are not yet approved if they show promise. Uh, and psilocybin falls into that category. But the DEA, and don't ask me what the DEA has to do with psychiatry and um, um, helping people uh, avoid depression and, and avoid end of life uh, troubles, but they do because they said, oh, no. Even though there's a right to try act, you can't use the psilocybin because that's a that's a class. Well, I forget what is it schedule. Is psilocybin schedule? No, schedule two probably. But yeah. anyway, it's against the law. Mm-hmm. And even though there's a law that says you can do it, uh, it's against our law, and our law is more important. So no. So we were protesting that action of the DEA. They arrested us. First time I got handcuffed, put in the paddy wagon. I've put on handcuffs because I used to be a law enforcement officer. <laughs> and I, maybe they put them on me. No, I don't think I'd even let my fellow law enforcement officers put the handcuffs on me. You know, I trust everybody, but not not quite that far. You know, <laughs> next thing you know, I'd be in the trunk of the car. Yeah, I'd be right. dumped in the river. You know. Oh, you're done. But yeah. anyway, uh, the, the, eventually, uh, in August, the DEA dropped the charges completely because they said, you know, um, we don't think we can win our case. <laughs> uh, and so I got off scot-free. My first time I got arrested, about my hundredth time I arrested somebody. And, um, but I mean, really, we were right. And even the DEA scratched their heads and went, they didn't say, oh, yeah, she should be able to use it. But they unarrested us by dropping all the charges. There you go. Well, yep. uh, that's good. They did that. But, you know, I, you know, I, I, I commemorate you for, you know, standing up for what you believe in. Um, I think there are a lot of people, myself included, maybe who would be you know terrified at the prospect of getting arrested. Well, I've been on the other side of the law, so I, 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 I just joked with the cops. I was their best friend among the crowd because I, they knew I was a cop. I told them, and the, I, I, having been one, it is a brotherhood, and that includes the women that are police officers. Um, it, once you've been on the inside for a couple of years, <laughs> you're always on the inside. I'm always going to be an ex-cop. Uh, it's a, it's a pretty cool fraternity. I think they have misbehaved badly, but mostly I think they misbehaved badly because of the drug war. Mm. Yeah, it's the drug war that changed uh, policing from what I did in 1973 and four to what they're doing today. Um, you know, police officers used to understand that you needed to have friends, not enemies in the mm. citizenry. Yeah. But, you know, I want to talk about something also uh, with respect to that, this assisted therapy. Sure. Um, since the last time I was here, I've uh, done a lot of work. I read mostly books about the, the drugs and the drug war. I want to understand every drug. And there's something called MDMA-assisted therapy. Mm. MDMA, uh, the street name might be Molly or yep. Ecstasy, uh, and it makes you feel good. That's why they call it Ecstasy. And 
MDMA assisted therapy is actually further ahead in the FDA process than anything else. It's already in stage four trials. Wow. I might be getting my stages mixed up. I think it's stage three for the FDA and it's stage four for cancer. But uh, whatever stage it is, it's in the last stage of FDA trials and it is going to be approved in the near future, let's just say two years. But this, this therapy has been tested during stage three trials on people with PTSD and guess what? It does just as well as psilocybin. So if somebody has PTSD, and who has PTSD? Well, it's not just soldiers, but let's talk about that. Because in Iowa, every year there are 70 veterans who commit suicide because of PTSD. Wow. Now, if you could save 65% of them, which the initial trials say you could, that's 42 suicides every year in Iowa we can prevent, almost one a week, if Iowa would legalize MDMA on a state level. Now, it'll still be illegal on a federal level, but we already know that the state can legalize cannabis, and it's still illegal on the federal level, and they, they can have all kinds of businesses and entrepreneurs and manufacturers and growers and suppliers, and the feds aren't coming in because the feds get it. People want to be able to consume cannabis legally. So all Iowa would have to do, and I have asked Kim Reynolds to do this, and I've written to all 150 current Iowa legislators, 100 in the House and 50 in the Senate, and I said, will you please call an emergency special session of the Iowa legislature for the single purpose of legalizing MDMA in Iowa so we can save a veteran's life this week? And... It's just a blank wall. I, I don't get any kind of response whatsoever from her. I've had some legislators that have uh, said, yeah, I'll, I'll jump on that bandwagon, but we got to get a lot more before we can get Kim to move. Mm. And we already know she's, she thinks marijuana is a gateway drug, and God knows what she thinks about MDMA. But this is a medical procedure performed by trained therapists with an extremely safe substance that has zero uh, serious side effects and it's effective and it's inexpensive it, it's a three-day process so you have to pay for a therapist for three days and you probably have to pay about a nickel for the mdma because that stuff's it's cheap as hell to make oh, yeah. uh it would be pure the pure product you wouldn't have to worry about getting any fentanyl in it or some mm -hmm. diluted street drug or you know oh actually it turns out that's half xanax and half pertex yeah, what do you know? right. um i don't i have no idea why the, the government would stand around remember that's who created the problem Mm -hmm. The reason that, that MDMA is not legal in Iowa is because Iowa made, Iowa legislature, our politicians made it illegal. This is a problem they created. I don't know why they are unwilling to uncreate it when it saves lives. It saves a veteran's life almost every day. Yeah. Is that the kind of place we want to live in? It's like, well, I know you might commit suicide tomorrow, sir, but uh, you know, just, just wait until it's legal. <laughs> Say, so, okay, I'll put my depression on hold. I'll go home and act normal. And then after it's legal, then I'll get depressed again, and then I'll have this therapy. Uh, it's just mind-boggling to me. I have no idea how people can live with themselves once they've discovered this. And I know every Iowa legislature, legislator, they know this. I have written them three emails. If they didn't read them, don't blame me. Yeah, well, I mean, that... Yeah, I mean, that's just a problem. I think, you know, there's obviously the, um, you know, the financial incentives for them to not legalize things. But, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think there are. I think they're just stupid. I'm sorry. I didn't say that out loud. I, I think they're just ignorant. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's a lot of it. I mean, probably most of it, to be honest. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's hard to break through people's consciousness. Yeah. It really is. And I feel sorry for the legislators who, I'm not the only person that would like them to do something. I'm just the only person who's not asking them for money. Yeah, yeah. This, well, I mean, this, this would literally be free for the government. Hmm. Wouldn't cost the government one penny. And it would save one veteran's life almost every week. Yeah. What's the, what's the problem here? Where's the moral strength that says, I would rather have them die? Because that's what you're saying. No, yeah, I agree, yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it'd be one thing if it cost a million dollars and you're going to run up a you know, $100 million bill, but you're not. It's free. No, yeah. I don't know how they live with themselves, except ignorance is bliss. 
Yeah, and I mean, it is pure ignorance. I think if people really were able to see at face value, um, you know, what the drug, you know, drug war is really doing, they would, yeah, I mean, they, how could you live with yourself? Exactly. I mean, it's, it's crazy. I mean, you know, I, not to talk about this too much, but I, I've personally had, you know, very successful, um, you know, experiences from psychedelics. It's actually the reason I quit smoking cigarettes, <laughs> um, is from LSD. And I think, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, these drugs are, to me, it's so obvious that they can help people. And the possible negation, like, oh, they're getting high or whatever, you know, I, I don't think that's a big enough reason to make something legal. It's just not. Um, I'm still smoking. Can I have some of that LSD? <laughs> right here, man. Here's a tab. Ah, fuck no, I wish. you know, I, I wish. I, I'm a part time <laughs> smoker, but. Uh, about five weeks ago, I decided that the benefit of the nicotine, because that's the only part that has a, an impact except the smoke, which kills you. Um, you know, it is an energy thing. Yeah, nicotine is actually one of the safest addictions. You know, I've read that in England they uh, mm -hmm. they just take the gum, like they use the gum like they would caffeine, and like they it's actually healthier than like drink coffee all the time yeah yeah nicotine has been uh, given a bad name but the nicotine itself is uh, extremely safe it's also extremely addictive it's one of the fastest things you can get addicted to mm. um i don't know all the science on this but there must be some receptors that they need something in them and nicotine fulfills that role and then when you don't have the nicotine it, it still wants that something and says hey give me give this back to me i think it's like three days you can become addic addicted to nicotine wow and heroin uh is more like mm, three or seven days to a month it depends on how much you use all that kind of stuff but yeah uh, we're talking about daily use you, you really can't get addicted to any of these things if you don't uh, use them daily but, yeah that's the nature of how those things work in your body but nicotine is as far as i know the safest thing to be addicted to uh, and heroin is, is only number two. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, you know, if you compare like alcohol and heroin, you know, heroin, you can kick in like a week. Um, you know, if you want to kick that addiction, it's it's actually as long as like, you know, people are there to make sure you're safe. It's pretty easy. But alcohol can take months, years sometimes. Yeah, the physiology is uh, heroin is actually three days. Oh, OK. Yeah. And you can't die. If you go cold turkey off of heroin, I don't care how much you're, you're taking before that. You can't die from uh, stopping it. But alcohol, if if your body needs it and you quit giving it, uh, it's very. It can be very deadly. You can just literally die because you didn't get alcohol. Yeah. So it's a lot more dangerous to be addicted to alcohol than it is to heroin. Exactly. And this is the problem with the war on drugs: is that people are not educated on this. They they think the opposite. You know. Well, yeah, especially with heroin, they've managed to scare the bejesus out of everybody with horror stories. Yeah, um, I'm actually reading a extremely interesting book right now called Orphans, Opiums, Orphan, Orphans. Jeez, it's a little tricky. <laughs> Opiums, Orphans, yeah, and it's a history of drug prohibition in the world, not just the United States. And um, yeah, I mean, they got it wrong. They've they've had it wrong for 500 years. It's, it's an extremely useful plant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's uh, there's there's actually no better painkiller than heroin, which of course is just two uh, morphine mole molecules. Uh, it's it's diacetylmorphine, which is two morphine molecules joined by an acetyl bond, uh, and nothing works better. Uh, the reason I mean heroin is better than morphine, and morphine is legal in the United States, and heroin is not. So think about that. Um, the uh, when when those two morphine molecules go into your uh, blood, they immediately they split from heroin and now you've just got two morphine molecules so it's actually faster acting oh it's it, it, interesting yeah no it's it's better painkiller than morphine morphine is a pretty good painkiller uh well it's it's second best <laughs> nothing <laughs> i mean i'm sorry but all the other ones every opioid that's ever been invented well it was only invented for one reason and that's because morphine and heroin were illegal <laughs> there's no reason to take any of those pills your doctors ever gave you and you know it's not you don't have to inject uh either one of those yeah, yeah. No, no. Injection. We just have yeah. this picture in our mind of somebody lying on the street, strung out, needle in their arm. It's like, oh, God, we can't have that. Let's make heroin illegal. Well, that's just complete bullshit. We've had heroin and morphine in legal in the United States and cocaine. Well, in fact, uh, today, m both morphine and cocaine are legal in Iowa, and so is methamphetamine. You have to have a prescription. Oh, <laughs> I was going to say. But you can't get a prescription for heroin. Yeah. But we've already tried the experiment. The, these things were around long before they were outlawed. Morphine was invented, I think, in 1843 or something like that. Heroin wasn't invented until, uh, I think it was early 1890. Hmm. 
here's a here's a good uh, trivia for you though the the same guy who invented heroin invented aspirin huh 30 days later <laughs> he worked for a Bayer company you know you've heard of Bayer aspirin but you probably haven't heard of Bayer heroin but they had it uh, so heroin was legal for a long time and nobody was dying of it yeah. the only problem there's the, the, the people that had problems were just addicted that's all addiction is meaningless if it doesn't hurt your life addiction just means two things you, you have to have it and you're building up a tolerance so as long as you have plenty of it then so what my mom died addicted to fentanyl she got a prescription from the doctor and she was happy she had she was a fentanyl addict for the last five years of her life she had a patch there's no way in hell she, you know, she she liked not being not being in pain. Wow, she was 95 years old when she started, and she lived till she was 100. So these things that we build out is scary. You know, fentanyl on the streets is killing people. Almost 100,000 people. We don't know exactly, but there were 107,000 people that died of drug overdoses just just last year. There were 426 in Iowa. But they weren't buying the stuff from the doctor. <laughs> yeah, when a lot of that is because they're mixing it with other drugs too, or like the shit that they're getting has you know some other compound that's you know mixing incorrectly. That's usually why people overdose from these drugs. Yeah, uh, if you're if you're going to use heroin, you should uh, follow the directions. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take it with a shot or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that uh, that's called um, multi drug. Because yeah. alcohol is a drug, heroin is a drug, take them together, bad things might happen. Uh, but who gets the directions? When you go buy drugs on the street, heroin on the street, do you get a little packet that says, you know, no. these are the directions for using this safely? No. They just write a Sharpie on the bag either. Like, all right, yeah. step one. <laughs> yeah. If you don't give people directions, you can't be surprised when they don't follow them. If you do give people directions and they don't follow them, well, now the responsibility is on the person who didn't follow the directions. I agree. Yeah. But if you only allow them to buy it on the street and it's not a safe supply, now the guilty party is you because you made it illegal to have, to get a safe supply. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they did what they needed to do to to do whatever it is they wanted to do, uh, and they died. It's your fault. You're the murderer. Yeah. It, it, I, there's no excuse for that. Forcing people to buy drugs on the street that are impure and of unknown quantity, not giving them directions, we should throw you in jail because you, that way you won't do any more harm. And by the way, we're going to take away your legislator badge too, so you're not going to be able to vote for laws anymore. Think about it because until you figure it out that you're the murderer, I want you locked up where you won't do any more harm. I agree. I agree. Well, and you know, going I'm not displaying any passion here, am I? Because I am a very calm, <laughs> cool, and collected guy. I don't. I don't get emotional. All of my decisions are made with my brain, not with my heart. And I try and stay level and even keeled all the time. So don't let me get. Don't let me run away here. Well, that's tamp a, me down. You know. That's a, <laughs> Rick. Rick. Down boy. Down boy. Quit barking. <laughs> Well, that's another thing I love about you, Rick. Uh, but, you know, like, even going back to, like, you know, you talking about your mother being, like, a fentanyl addict, I wouldn't even consider her an addict. You know, I think addiction, when they define addiction, it's you have a negative, like, it's affecting your life negatively. If she's just taking fentanyl and it's making her happier, it's not affecting her negatively, I wouldn't even consider that an addiction. She's just a user. Well, you make a good point. Uh, officially, she is an addict. But we don't really care. What we have a different w a word for that now. It's called opium use disorder. Mm. Yeah, we don't call them addicts anymore. You're definitely not politically correct today. Sorry, <laughs> you know, you're going to get two demerits. Well, the, uh, that's yeah, the whole show. So. In order, <laughs> yeah, the whole show. I love this show. It's my favorite podcast. You guys should tell your friends. Okay, tell your enemies. Hell, they might like it too. Tell everybody. Get a little sticker. <laughs> Put it on the all the stuff in the grocery store. Make make sure you put it on the back of the bottle so the person who's buying it doesn't read your sticker until they go home and they go, what's this about the McAllister? <laughs> I think I'll check this out. Um, no, it's a great show. I love here. I love being here. I love talking to you, and it's a lot of fun. Thank you, um, Yeah, so in the world of, of drug 
problems. Uh, we don't call them addicts anymore. We call we say they have an opium use disorder or an alcohol use disorder. And my mom did not. It's, it's the disorder that it's the what you're just talking about. The fact that it's a negative impact in your life that makes it a disorder. So as long as it's not negatively impacting your life, you do not have an opium use disorder problem. You're just addicted. Okay. That, it's a huge difference, yeah. Because yeah, you, you don't I have agree. you don't have to have an, a, a disorder to be addicted. Um, I, we might we might be splitting uh, hairs here, but um, my, the, the point is is valid that there's nothing wrong with being an addict. Mm-hmm. I agree. No, it's, it, if if it doesn't have any negative impact on your life, who cares? A lot of diabetics are addicted to insulin. What's the problem? I don't. I don't want to be uh, uh, addicted to insulin, and I'm lucky that I don't have to be. But I'm not going to arrest the person who is addicted to it. Why would I arrest the person who's addicted to, to opium or heroin or morphine or amphetamines? I agree. I agree. Yeah. At the end of the day, that person should not sit in a cage for yeah. what they do. Yeah, I wanted to put my mom in a cage. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we did. In a way, we did, right? No, we, I, in a way, we did because she let, uh, you know, she spent, I think, maybe even the last 10 years of her life in a, um, uh, I don't even know what you call these anymore. When I was a kid, we used to call them nursing homes, but, you know, uh, not at just an end of life. Uh, what do you call these? Um, those places? Hospice. No, before that. <laughs> the uh, hospice was at the very end. But you, you know, you I get old, you, it's hard, having a hard time taking care of yourself and your house, and you go, I'm going to assisted living. There you go. There we go. There we go. So she went to an assisted living facility, but if you tried to leave, uh, alarm went off, <laughs> and they hauled you back in. It's, that's prison. Yeah. <laughs> Essentially. So, yeah, we did cage her up, but not because she uh, was a fentanyl addict. Yeah. Just because, yeah. I mean, well, and sometimes you need that when you're getting up there, you know. For well, sure. I'll tell you what. If I'm ever in that kind of condition, I want you to give me a lot of heroin. <laughs> <laughs> I'll deliver it to you personally. Yeah, you know, here's, here's another thing. It's funny. Uh, heroin is the obvious best way to kill yourself. <laughs> I mean, come on, guys. And I'm not talking right? about street heroin. Because God knows you, you might that might be mixed with something that that gave you the opposite reaction. It might like be a psychedelic drug, yeah, or right, it could be right. a methamphetamine, just real heroin, the pure stuff that you you expect to get from a pharmacy, uh, is a fantastic way to commit suicide. Because all you're going to do is enjoy yourself until you fall asleep, and then you're not going to wake up. So why is it that the government has such a hard time killing people when they want to kill them? <laughs> They have all these bizarre things to kill people with. Electric chairs. Like, come on. You're going to shit your pants. <laughs> Seriously. You are going to shit your pants. Uh, but also, um, it might not work. They, they might just like fry your left arm and you're, put you in a lot of pain. And then they're, you know, they're going to take you away and bring you back. Uh, they're, 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 there's all these drugs that they want to inject you with. It's like they're trying to make killing someone into a grueling ordeal. Why don't you just give the guy some heroin pills and let him start munching down? <laughs> right. He's not going to scream. He's not going to shout. He's not going to struggle. You know, you can even put him in a room and say, "We don't care, but you got to take all these. Otherwise, yeah, right. you know, otherwise we're going to give you more." Yeah, check him on. Check on him in an hour. Like <laughs> I have yeah. no idea why the government insists on killing people so so gruesome, such so so Ill, unempathetic. It's like. We're going to kill you, by God, and we're going to make your last moments on Earth the worst you've ever had. Oh, yeah. Come that's, on. That's their attitude, for what, sure. That's just bizarre. I mean, it was more humane when we hang, when we hung them, although some people survived the hanging, uh, or just when we did a firing squad and shot them. That's more humane than the way we try and kill them today. Yeah, true. You know, the drugs that we try and kill them with, oh, my God, they're so dangerous that um, the pharmacies don't want to sell them anymore. They're having a hard time getting their hands on the drugs that kill people. Well, just give them heroin. <laughs> yeah, right. They Who's get... going to complain? The people, the witnesses, you know, they can help themselves a little bit, too. And just it'll, It makes it easier to watch somebody die. If you're just on a little bit of heroin, you know, you're like, you're feeling pretty good. And uh, there he is. Yeah, he's dead. I'm a witness. 
<laughs> oh, that would be quite the thing. You know, I, sure. sometimes I say things, you know, I like to make jokes. I, yeah. I'm not well, that's why I love having you, teller. man. I'm not a very good joke teller, but I like to make jokes. I like to, you know, just have an enjoyable repartee with people. Yeah. Um, but I'm totally serious. I, I really do not understand why we insist on a gruesome killing as opposed to a pleasurable one for somebody who we are going to kill. I agree, hundred percent. Can't wrap my can't wrap it, my arms around that one. Yeah. Well, I hate to end on such a dark tone. No way. But, uh, <laughs> you said we we're going to go for an hour. <laughs> it's been an hour, man. There's We've no way it's been an hour. Hour fourteen. Oh man, time flies. Are yeah, you I know. I, yeah, I, got... I wasn't looking at my watch because I didn't want uh, people to think I was like trying to, <laughs> to end early. You're like, well, who was it? George Bush that looked at his watch and he, he lost the presidential election. <laughs> I don't want. I don't want to lose the governor's race just because I looked at my watch on the podcast. Uh, but yeah, this is great. Let's have just one more topic, though. I'm not ready to. I, okay, I need, okay. I need to taper off. Okay. Well, let me let me ask you this. Uh, you, you've been, uh, you know, you've been doing a lot coming up to your election. Kind of circling back to the beginning, I guess. Um, how many different like uh, you know spots have you been doing? Like, I'm sure you've been talking to a lot of different people. You say you've been, um, you talked to ten thousand people. Try to get your signature. Like, what's been your journey? You know, with people, both you know, voters, you know, officials, um, leading up to this election, what's been your experience? Well, most of my time has been spent since last spring um, arranging all these parades because I don't have, I don't have an executive assistant who does this for me. Um, asking people for money because that's what wins elections. Uh, talking to news outlets, podcasts. Mm -hmm bunch of podcasts i saw you on uh joshua smith's the yeah, break, yeah, break that cycle was fun. i yeah. did see that yeah, yeah that, that was, was fun, fun. i rec highly recommend it uh, for anybody that wants to get on a podcast to at least give him a call because you should if give you're me interesting do it you should give me his number because i actually would um love to interact with him yeah and, sure for sure um you know getting on tv getting on the radio doing newspaper interviews filling out questionnaires that all the newspapers send me to fill out all of which are different and all of which take me about two hours a piece because I'm, I want to answer the question. Um, and uh, answering the phone, people call, random people, my number's out there. Here, I'll give it to you right now. It's 319-333-444-555. Just joking. <laughs> it's 333-4449. And you should be able to memorize that because you take those first threes, add them up, that's nine. That's on the end. 333-4449, area code 319. So yeah, people call me up, random people, and if I'm available, I answer my phone, and if I, if I can, I talk to them. I've had a lot of conversations just with people who call me up. Uh, none of them are angry at me, and none of them, well, some of them, no, they don't call me up if they're already a fan. They call me up to have a serious discussion about issues. Mm. And it's great. I love having discussions about issues. You can't, you probably didn't pick up that I like to talk. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's it's fun. It's tw it's not twenty four hours a day because I do sleep, but I wake up in the morning. Today I woke up at uh, two forty five in the morning. It's not because I set my alarm. Uh, it's because as soon as I open my eyes, I started to think about the campaign, uh, and I'll, that's all I'll be doing until I get home tonight and put my head back down on my pillow. Uh, it's really intense. It's it's for me. It's intense all the time, and of course, right now it's even more intense. It's. Um, what less than three weeks to go yep uh, and i have three months of work to do so i do as much as i can and i triage every day uh i'm, I'm super happy that we're together now because i really enjoy this um i'm gonna get in my truck i'm gonna drive two hours and we're gonna go to another libertarian meeting awesome awesome <laughs> well hey man you're you're working you're busy and uh i love everything you're doing you got my vote as as you probably all right know, that's all sure. i needed that's the only reason i'm here i don't really like this guy <laughs> Well, a lot well of I need votes, right? <laughs> and I got one. And I want you to vote for me too, okay? <laughs> if you don't vote for me, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to let me know why not. Because I'm serious. No, I'm totally serious on this one. I'd like to know why people don't vote for me. Uh, maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm irritating. Maybe uh, you don't like the way I wear a hat everywhere I go instead of taking it off like a nice person. Or, or maybe, you, maybe you're not going to vote for me because you know I'm bald underneath. But I would like to know why you are not going to vote for me. I hope that you're not going to vote for me because you're afraid that a Republican or a Democrat could win, if could lose if you don't vote for them. If you're fearful, that's not a good reason to vote for somebody. 
you should like who it is that you're 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 going to vote for. You should be proud to say, yeah, I voted for somebody that I actually think would be the best candidate out of the three. That's all I ask. And if for some reason you don't want to vote for me, go to my website, rickstewart.com. There's a comment session section. Let me know. Because I, I want to know why anybody wouldn't vote for me over those two lame opponents I have. <laughs> <laughs> No, That's they're the very clip. good people. No, no, kidding. Yeah. yeah, they're very they're very good people. They're 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 both good people. I I'd, I'd be a better governor. I, I might hire them for a job in the in government or uh, you know, I mean I, there's nothing wrong with those two people. But if you want the best person for the job in the job, I think you need to vote for me. Hey, thanks. I, I agree with that. And I'll, sure. I've already got one, so you won't be alone. Haha. <laughs> yep. You got my crazy ass now, I'm kidding. <laughs> Uh, Rick, hey, I got a question for you. How old are you? Uh, 27. What a lucky guy. <laughs> it's almost the opposite of me. I'm 71. <laughs> Next year, I'll be the opposite if you don't have a birthday for Yeah, right. You have to, you'll have to have that yeah. sweet spot. Yeah. There. <laughs> we only get to do that once in our life, I think. Maybe maybe not. Maybe who knows? Who knows? I'll do that math afterwards. <laughs> as long as there's no percentages. Uh, awesome. Rick, it's been a pleasure, man. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you on and you know i love seeing your campaign and i love to have you back on um obviously people can find you through your website is there anything else you want to you know any kind of events or anything you want to mention before we wrap up here yeah i want you and my, you and i to uh, agree that we're gonna i'm gonna come back after the election hell yeah let's we'll talk about it hell yeah let's do it let's do it but that this next time we're gonna do it with uh, gin and tonics ha <laughs> Hell yeah, man! I would love to have a drink with you. That'd be yeah. awesome. I can't, I can't drink uh, now because somebody might take a picture of it and then they'd figure out how to make it me look bad and <laughs> and uh, you know they put a put my picture on the postcard and, and then they advertise to everybody. This is what you'll get if Rick Stewart gets a vote from you. They'll <laughs> they'll Photoshop you doing heroin or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> he wants to, he wants you to do this. All right, let's make it happen, guys. All right, thanks. Fuck yeah. All right, guys. I'm out. He's out. Go vote for him. All right. Peace.